Dominic, are you there? Can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Is this Dominic? Yeah. Hi, Dominic. Hi. Scott. I can hear you. Okay, you can hear me. Good. All right. Uh, can anyone, anyone else? else? I can hear you. This is Jess. Hi, Jess. Okay, fantastic. So we're hey, just Jess. getting. Uh, hey. We're gonna. Um, and you can see the screen, I trust. I can see the green okay. screen. It says generate webinar series. Yeah. Super. Okay. Cool. All right. So I'm gonna as we start doing this, I'm gonna ask you to put yourself on mute. Maybe you can stay on, uh, not on mute, Scott, but the rest of you can mute. Right. Okay. If you can mute that, um, maybe Scott, it's nice to have, just have you there, right? Totally. Um, right as as we do this. So so the only thing that I can't figure out on this screen um, is the fact that uh, I had a PowerPoint set, as you can see, but it 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 doesn't do it the way I had set a PowerPoint. So who knows? It doesn't matter. It won't matter. Um, we'll have to sacrifice that uh, technological innovation. Um, so, uh, I, Scott, do you know how many people are registered for uh, this session? Let me check. I know last time I checked it was close to 30, so let me do okay. a final count. No, no, it's okay. It doesn't matter. 30 is good, so, you know, that means we'll have quite a few people joining us. So, uh, for the rest of you, uh, we'll start in, um, I'd say, about five minutes or so. I don't want to wait too long, um, but as you come on, uh, just make sure you can hear me and see the screen, and then if there's any problem, you can use the chat box just to send me um, uh, the, the, any, any messages that you have. So uh, keep that in mind as we go along here. This is being recorded so that you can access this again. Um, all of our webinar series here, the Generate Webinar series, are being recorded. Um, and I would suspect that have most of you attended the first one? Have you all uh, uh, been to the first web? I'm uh, sorry, have listened to the first webinar? Not everybody, Dom, but a good okay. few then have. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. Just wanted to check. Pick it. it up, okay. people along the way. Okay. All right, Scott. I was actually at the College of the North Atlantic St. John's campus today and did a presentation and mentioned it. So a couple of people there wanted okay, to good. also join in. Okay. Fantastic. Did we start first one? Yep. Yeah. So you know the good news about this is they. You know, collectively, if you listen to all of the webinars, they're great, but they can also be listened to individually. So it, you don't, you know, it doesn't matter where you start from what angle. So that is the good news as well. Um, we actually have 32 registered for today. Okay. All right. And then okay. currently, uh, currently, uh, I don't know how many people. But this technology always throws me off a bit, but that's okay. I, um, I don't know how many people it's showing that we've got here. Um, uh, so we'll still wait a few more, a couple more quick minutes. Oh, people right. are just jumping on. There we go. We got three more jumps on. Oh, four, five. Four more. Okay. Um, I guess on your end you can see who's jumping on, who's on, right? So I, I just want to we welcome people. Four more. Okay. So I just want to welcome you to come in, Jess and Mark and Michael and Nicole and Ryan and Sandy, um, as you come on in. Uh, and Nicole. Pardon me. I said I okay. just saw Nicole. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I don't have I don't have the luxury of having a camera on me like you do, Scott. So I'm just. <laughs> I won't leave. I'm only leaving it on at the beginning. I'm sure people don't want to stare at me for the whole webinar. <laughs> okay. Well, you don't know. I <laughs> I've gone there. <laughs> I will uh, know how this works. All right. Um, Okay, with this technology here. Let me get back to the chat. All right. So um, as we start getting uh, – uh, the, the other good news uh, is that Scott will be emailing you this uh, PowerPoint. Am I correct, Scott? Uh, if they want. So if anybody yeah, can, want. wants to connect with me, I'll put in the chat box right now, Dominic, my email address. Yeah. Sure. And so people can reach out to me because I don't want to send them an email if they don't want. But if you would exactly. like a copy of – this Dominic slides, please send me an email. I'll put it in the chat box. And I can also send you a link to uh, the YouTube because we are recording this. And uh, hopefully in about 24 hours time, we'll have this uploaded to YouTube so anybody can watch it again or at their convenience. Good. Okay. So um, 
it is showing that it's recording, so that's good, right? Yes. Okay. So okay. if anybody has a question or if they want to, all questions are now going to be recorded from here on in. Okay. All right. So watch out. No, just, it's okay. Any question is, is fine. So we're okay with that. Okay. And then let me see who else we've got. Has anyone else joined us here? How many participants do we have? Um, we've got, well, we've got, uh, it looks like we've got 12, 12, 13 people so far at this point. Um, so Scott here, as you can see, if you, if you want these slides emailed to you, um, here's the email address at um, sandrews at futurepreneur.ca. So I think we will get started, um, if that's okay with you. Uh, Scott, what do you think? Should we give it a, a start? No, let's go. Wait a minute. Okay. So everyone, good afternoon. My name is Dominic Lankar, and um, I'm the entrepreneur in residence here in Toronto. Um, and this is a and then, and also online we have Scott Andrews, who's based out in St. John's, and uh, I was there in uh, Newfoundland uh, back in November. So I did a whole tour of Newfoundland and some workshop presentations, and um, looking forward to coming back in March again. So that's just a bit about me. Um, uh, and, and again, you know, my role here at um, Futurepreneur is to help people assess the viability of their business idea and then to help them on their business plan. So that's my role here. Um, and I also get um, asked to speak quite a bit um, in, in different workshops or, or in public forums. So uh, let's get going here. This second series a webinar is about market research or defining your customer. And if you uh, remember, for those of you that listened in on the very first one, is that we looked at a business plan, and just to recap, a business plan is the future path of a business. And I gave you this overview of an outline, which as you can see at the beginning is the executive summary and then company profile, uh, market research, sales, and marketing operations and finance. So what we did in the first one, we did company profile and operations, which is really the face of the company. Um, now we are going to go into market research, which is the second uh, major piece here. Um, and it's a really big piece of the puzzle. Um, in my experience, um, you can't do enough of market research. And market research, by the way, is always ongoing. So even when you finish writing the business plan uh, and you start your business, market research continues. Like I'm always doing um, surveys with my workshops, and I've been, I, you know, I've lost count, but certainly I've done at least 500 workshops in my life, and I still do um, surveys and, and to get feedback. So, you know, market research is ongoing. But from a business perspective, let's take a look what market research is really all about. Um, and I prepared here to show you um, this uh, this graph. It's not even a graph. What is it? <laughs> what do you call this? Um, uh, help me out, Scott. What is this? Uh, it's a pie. That, that would be a pie chart. Uh, that would be a pie chart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. It must be the afternoon. So you can, if you look at this pie chart, there are three major sections. One is the marketplace, one is the customers, and one is the offerings. So the way this works, and, and, and a, what, a good way to remember what market research is all about, is too many people stay... Uh, talk too much about the marketplace, the industry, and the, you know, how big the industry is and what the industry is all about. But really, as entrepreneurs, and especially for most of us that are starting businesses, we're really micro-entrepreneurs, right? We want to get to know our local market fast. And I don't care if you're doing an online business. You, you know, your whole world is not your market. You want to focus on a certain area. So that's why you see local market is the, where you want to get to in terms of your market research. The same goes for your offerings. So you can offer a lot in your business. And, and, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs make the mistake of trying to offer so much. Um, and instead, pick a niche. So instead of telling me, you, you know, you're going to st start a brand of clothing line, tell me which product you're leading with. So if it's blouses, then it's blouses. You start with that as your niche. Um, telling me you have a brand and not have any products yet to sell doesn't tell me very much. So that niche becomes really important. And customers, and customers, you need to get very specific. Not everybody and anybody is your customer. And of course, 
um, that's that's usually uh, something that tells me you, you need to do a lot more work. So these are the three areas that ultimately we're going to look at. And the thing to keep in mind as you as you go into market research is that you are really a detective. So you're not going to get all these answers. They're not black and white. Um, the the whole point of this market research it's it, you can't just go on the internet you can't just google something and and it's not under staff Canada where you're going to get all these answers so being a detective really means that it's a combination of getting information on the net on on your competitors websites talking to people in your industry talking to customers um, using your your experience in the industry um, or your experience working period so uh, talking to suppliers uh, so the the whole point of this exercise when you're doing market research, just remember that it's not going to be a black and white uh, answer. A lot there's going to be some gray shades. And and you know and by the way, as we start doing this uh, webinar, I'm going to have a a break. I'm going to ask you if you've got any questions. So I'll be doing that throughout of this all of this. Um, so a detective, how can you play detective? And one of the things to keep in mind as you do this is right in the third person. So that means instead of saying, I will, um, talk about it as, you know, ABC company or whatever you name your company. One of the things that we all need to come to terms with is that, you know, starting a business is a very emotional undertaking. So we get so wrapped around it and we forget that we need to create some distance because if we don't, um, it's when we get into trouble. Right? It's the nature of the beast of running a business. There's a lot of emotion in writing on this because, of course, as you start doing this, um, your income is dependent on the success of the business. And if it doesn't work out, you feel um, disheartened, maybe hurt, and maybe you don't want to start this again. And, and, and far from that, I think if you step back and you look at it as, as much as you can from an objective viewpoint, um, you'll start to see that there are things you can do um, that m you may have not have thought of before. And that, to me, is the benefit of doing an effective business plan. Let's be very clear. I read a lot of business plans, um, and a lot of business plans aren't that effective, aren't that well written. And I'm hoping that through today you'll start to see how you can um, focus your energies in the right area. The next thing is keep it concise and jargon-free. Um, nothing is disheartening than me reading um, a business plan, and they're throwing jargon. I haven't got a clue what they're talking about. So your job is to tell me what that jargon means in very simple terms. And ultimately, you're answering the so what question. The so what question goes something like this. If you tell me, you give me some numbers, and let's say you're starting a, I don't know, a shoe store in St. John's, and you tell me there are, you know, I don't know, 6,000 shoe stores in Canada, I'm going to go, and so what? Why should I care? Because I really don't. So you need to make your point. What is the point you're trying to make? If you're telling me that 6,000 shoe stores in Canada is a good thing, is that really true? So, but it would be another thing to say that you know certain types of shoes are selling more, and they're certainly selling uh, a faster in let's say Newfoundland. Great. So you're making a point that you want to carry a certain type of shoe, and statistically speaking, in the last three years, these types of shoes have been on the increase. So that's okay. So as long as you are making a point, you can use stats um, as much as you like. So you're providing some evidence and a rationale. It doesn't always have to be from numbers, and sometimes, by the way, you can't get these numbers. You can't find them on the internet, right? No one's going to readily tell you how much they make selling their shoes in St. John's in the first year of business unless you go up and talk to the owner. So sometimes direct experience is useful. If you've worked in a shoe store for five years, you can use that as making your point. You can also use interviews, surveys, and observations, right? People forget that sometimes this last piece of the puzzle, interviewing potential customers, surveying customers, and just observations. If you started a shoe store in St. John's and you wanted to open a certain intersection there, then you can stand out there for three or four hours and see how much foot traffic there is. There's some useful information, right? So some of uh, the things I'm going to be telling you is really um, it, it, it's it's simple. It, it can be simple when you start doing a business plan, and sometimes we tend to overcomplicate it. The other thing to keep in mind as we look at your business plan is that a business plan is testing assumptions. 
because this is about the future, you're going to make some assumptions. The assumptions about your business, assumptions about the industry, the assumptions how you get customers, assumptions about who the customers are. However, if you spend too much time being superficial about this, that is, you kind of say, well, this is, you know, uh, St. John's doesn't have a shoe store and, 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 and uh, doesn't have this kind of shoe store, and therefore, uh, I think it's going to work. Um, there's a gap, uh, um, and you're very simplistic in your analysis. It may work against you. It's what I call, or you may have read, called first-level thinking. Second-level thinking is when you go a bit deeper, and you actually test this. Is this true? What are some of the challenges in the industry? So to me, a good market research is not about just telling me why you think this is going to work. I think this is great because, like I get this a lot with people who want to start um, uh, a business or healthy food, right? I'm, I'm going to start a uh, healthy food. I'm going to do a, the latest uh, healthy sauce like or meat sauce or whatever it is. And then they give me stats and stats and stats about what people are getting, being healthier. Well, you know, I don't need 16 pages of that. Maybe I need half a paragraph. That's it. I get it. I get that people have been healthier, but I want to know why your particular sauce or why your particular shoe store is going to work and how it's going to work. So I'm more interested in the how, not so much the why, because we spend too much time kind of talking about possibility. In the market research, you want to start talking your energy on probability. So I, I bring that to your attention because, you know, uh, you know, the business plan is really about the future and testing assumptions. So the first key question that you want to answer here is how does the industry work from the viewpoint of your customer? Not from your point of view, not because you want to start a business, and let me give you analysis of the industry, but what options does your customer have? So if, for example, I wanted to start a shoe store in St. John's, then you can't just talk about the shoe industry. What you want to talk about is, so if I live in St. John's today, what are my options for buying shoes? Can I go to a big, you know, uh, uh, shopping mall and go to the um, the local? Do you guys have a Hudson's Bay out there? I'm sure you do. Scott, do you have a Hudson's Bay out there? No, we don't. No. Okay. Well, what kind of what kind of big stores do you have out there? We used to have a Sears. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, we have right, a lot of Walmart. So you, and a Walmart, right? So you know, you start looking at. All right, but okay. Sorry. Um, so what you start doing is you start looking at, as a customer, what options do you have to buy shoes, your particular shoes. And remember, you have always options to buy online now, right? You have also options not to buy the shoe. So when you're looking at your particular industry, you always need to see it through the lens of your customer, especially if you have a new product or a new service. So. You know, a lot of people, when they're writing their business plan, they say, well, this is a new product. No one's done it before, and therefore, this is going to work because it hasn't been done before. Actually, you have a bigger problem because now people are going to be much more hesitant and risk adverse to take a chance on that, especially if no one's done it, right? It's the same problem you have when if you're starting an online business, and you tell me, well, I want to sell online, but no one knows about my product, and I think it's going to be neat, but I but I don't know about you, but if I'm a customer and no one's bought this, I have no idea of testimonials or who's buying this or why they're buying it, I'm not going to take that chance. So you now have a, if, if you like, a bigger problem to overcome and talk about. So always remember from the viewpoint of the customer, what options do they have in buying or not buying your product? And that's going to be important. You'll see later on. When we move for, further to that, what's important to realize when you're doing this is to understand what are the rules of the game. And everybody, every business plays by certain rules, whether you like it or not. And what you don't want to say is, oh, I'm going to invent new rules, right? Uh, sometimes you get this thing that's called blue ocean strategy. It's a terrible idea when you're starting out. Before you can break the rules, you need to know what they are. So you ask yourself, are there a lot of key players? Or is, 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 it, you know, is it fragmented, right? Is there a lot of small shops? let's say, in shoe stores in St. John's. I'm picking on St. John's right now, but, you know, um, it could be Corner Brook or it can be any of the other towns that I visited. What are the trends? So the trends should be something that affects that particular business. Please don't talk about, you know, the unemployment rate or anything like that. That's fine and dandy. Um, but really, is there some social cultural event that's changing, let's say, if we talk about shoes, that people are buying different types of shoes because 
you know, certain designs are much more in now, and and there's uh, um, and, and the and the trends are, are changing, or technology. Maybe technology has a different impact on your business. So, what's important to succeed in the marketplace? And that means that you know what makes, and I'm using this example again, obviously, uh, what makes for a great shoe store? What is it? Do you have to carry? What's the atmosphere? What should the atmosphere be like when you open a shoe store? What are some of the best practices? Best practices really are about understanding the, the tried and true methodology of getting clients and keeping them. But always keep this in mind. If you're going to do that, then use this, what I call the 3x3 three three method. And the 3x3 three three method really means that you should be looking at um, your top three competitors who've been in business for maybe not more than three years, two or three years. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, if we take the example of shoe stores, you're not going to compete against the Walmart. You know, Walmart plays a different game. They play economies of scale. They sell on price. So what you want to do instead is focus your energies on other three competitors who are a couple of years ahead of you because it's from those competitors that you're going to learn the most, right? Let's face it. Walmart has a, you know, couple of billion dollars in just in, in marketing budget or, or it, like it's, they, they're, they're enormous of what they can do. But you as a, a micro entrepreneur may just have $5,000 in your bank account for a marketing budget. So you can't compete in the same way. But I bet you 10 to 1, someone that was in your business when they first started had to be resourceful. And so what did they do in the first couple of years to get business? That's where you can learn a lot. And, and, and you'll start to see as I take you through this, I'm a big fan of using your business plan in a much more practical way. Not in a, you know, I'm gonna write a big business plan, I'm, I'm gonna get big investors, because quite frankly, most people will not even look at your business plan, especially investors in the beginning until they see some sales. But how can I use the business plan to help me as an owner to move my business forward? And therefore, what's really important, as much as possible, is to go micro fast. So what's the local market like now? Let's face it. If I'm setting up a shoe store in St. John's, then in as much as I may want to know what's in Corner Brook and, and, and you know, Windsor, uh, Grand Falls, Windsor, or, or other places in Newfoundland, um, what I really want to know is what is the surrounding area in St. John's, you know, Mount Pearl and all of those other towns around there. Where do people go shopping for shoes? What's that market like? What's the maximum that someone will travel to my shoe store, for example? In some cases, you need to talk about how many customers there are in that area. Obviously, if I'm opening up a, a, a shoe store in Rocky Harbor Bay, or, then that's not going to work. There's just not enough customers, right? I only say that because I was there when I wasn't there, so just, right? But certainly, you know, you have to have a minimum amount of customers in the area. So go micro really, really fast. Go local as quickly as you can. And what you want to do in that area is do what's a quick SWOT analysis, and just to take you through what a SWOT analysis is, what you're really doing is you are looking at some of your competitors, or in some businesses, you can look at them as peers, right? Like a lot of people in the alternative health look at um, the people that, they're, that are doing the same similar work like them as peers, right? They don't see that as competitors. And I usually tell people, don't worry so much about competitors, worry more about your promise. Now, what you're looking at is what is the key strength of that particular competitor? You need to name them. So name a particular business. So name, um, a, you know, a, a shoe store on the other side of town that you think has been around. So what's apparently, what can you see that, that is their key strength? What can you observe that there's the key weakness? Be specific. Don't say they're lousy, right? They don't know anything about customer service. So you need to say something much more specific, such as, um, their customer service response is at least 10 minutes when I walk in the door. Whatever it is that you can observe is what you look at the first two key points. Strength, weaknesses. Opportunities, and I know some people do this differently, but I like doing it this way. What can you do better or what opportunity can you take advantage of that they're not doing or not doing well enough? So if we go back to the, my shoe store. I've just picked that as an example here. But then you may start saying, aha, that particular shoe store doesn't carry the latest men's shoe line, right? 
So I'm going to emphasize in my store that, we're always, that we always carry the latest trends of men's shoes, for example. Now, you may not do that, but there's an opportunity. So opportunities about what you could do, not necessarily that you will do. The same with threats. Threats is something that the other business could do to make your life difficult. So the other shoe store could open a second shoe store near you. Or they can decide to start carrying the latest designs. Doesn't mean that they will do it, but they could do it. And so you do this for at least three or four companies, and then you do one on yourself. And this is important. Because in the first, you notice in the first webinar, I talked about your promise. Well, your promise should be tied into what key opportunity are you going to go after? What's the number one benefit, the key choice you're going to do? And you may decide that the number one choice you're going to go after in the shoe store is to carry the latest trends. Now, that's the key message. That's your key promise. And everything has to work around that. Or it can be the most ecological, sustainable shoe wear, right? Or the most practical shoe wear. Whatever you decide, it should be one key benefit, and it should be used over and over again as your key message. So really, this is what I call the gap you tap. Which opportunity are you going to tap into? Where do you fit in? And again, you cannot be all things to all people, so you want to avoid saying, I'm going to do all types of shoes for a cross-section of people, right? The, the more niche, the better. Okay, so what I want to do at this point is open it up for you before we move on, because in the next section we're going to go into the, your, your target market. But are there questions at this point? Maybe why don't you just, um, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and just say, hi, this is so-and-so, I have a question. I have a question at this point. If not, I can move on. Okay. And I'm guessing too, Dominic, there'll be opportunities for questions at the end. Absolutely. So I'll Perfect. move on. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the next section. And the next section really is your target market. <clears throat> in your business plan, but, excuse me, excuse me there, I just got to get a drink of water here. In this section, I, I like to use the word your best customer as opposed to target market, um, because what ends up happening is for a lot of entrepreneurs, they start telling me they have like six different target markets, so I usually have them go back to their best customer. You notice I didn't say only customer. What are some common traits that they have? What is their persona or their avatar? And I decided, you know, let's just quickly use an example. Um, so in B2C or business to consumer, so that is where you're selling something directly to the end consumer, they're buying it and using it. I'm going to take you through a bit of an exercise just to um, how to do this. So I just came up with something just on the spot because I was in Newfoundland and I thought it was some beautiful scenery. So let's say you were doing adventure tours in Newfoundland. That was your business. You want to start adventure tours in Newfoundland. And now you want to decide who your best customers are. And, and let's say this adventure tours was geared towards a particular segment of the population. And let's just say it was geared towards women, right? So let's say there was other tours, but this was specifically for women. So you start, first of all, with the demographics. And the demographics, you look at gender, age, education, income level. Um, don't be afraid to make a choice. So even if you can help women and men, and if, if the primary audience is women, you're going to say women. Right? If, if the primary audience is men, you're going to say men. Um, the same with age. Don't say anyone you know, over 18 and under 80. That's not going to work. So a range is helpful. If most of them are college or, or university educated, that's what you're going to say. It's not that you're going to say no to other people, but this is going to be very important when we start talking about marketing. So this demographics, again, is about determining who is your best customer, not your only customer. And so therefore, ranges are, are very helpful when you're doing this. But obviously, demographics is not enough. The second would be what I call lifestyle. And this is where you talk about values. 
So, no, just because you're a woman and you're, you're between the ages of 28 and 38, that's not enough, obviously, and you, have, you may have certain income levels, um, but what's important in their life? So values really talk about that specific priority in their life. Where do they like to spend their money? Where do they like to spend their time? Where do they like to buy? So in this case, I said, you know, these are women who like to travel quite a bit and who would like adventure escapes. You know, maybe they like bungee jumping as well. They're not they're afraid to do bungee jumping. And I don't know if you have that out there, but, you know, I'm sure that there's just when I was there in Newfoundland, I'm sure there's lots of great things to do in the outdoors. Um, so these women would be more inclined to do, let's say, outdoor sports, skiing maybe, right? So that's the second layer, if you like. Then we go to the third layer, and that's behavior. So what are the triggers at which point they will more likely purchase your product or service? When are they likely to buy? So you may make an assumption, again, we're talking about assumptions, when they're planning a vacation for December or the summer months, right? Maybe they want to do something for this December or they want to do something in the summer months, right? They haven't decided. So obviously you have to go backtrack and you have to start thinking about your marketing earlier in September, right? To get them to plan for December and vice versa for the summer, you probably start thinking in, in early spring. The last layer, and this is important, is scope. So, you know, even if it's a virtual business, don't say the whole world's your market. Take a subsection of the world where you're going to focus on. Um, what's your radius? So if I was a, a, a like a physical location, let's say I had a physical location in St. John's, I may say that, you know, I'm not going to go broader than St. John's greater metropolitan area to get clients to start. Now, of course, this can grow as you grow your business, but having a radius, having something to work with is going to keep you focused, and this will be particularly useful to you when you start doing marketing. So then you create this avatar. Sometimes I'll get people to, to draw a person and say, tell me, you know, your best customer. Where would they live? And how would they walk? How would they talk? Um, what's in their mind? What's in their heart? Um, this, this makes it easier when you get to your marketing and identifying, right? Now, if on the other hand you're doing B2B, which is, you know, business to business, and that just means that you're selling to someone who in turn is either reselling it or in turn is giving it away. Right? So, for example, if you sell to corporations who, in turn, give something to their employees, that's still considered B2B. And sometimes B2B is also considered when you do pro professional services, like if you sell accounting services to other businesses. But I use this example. Let's say you made homemade raspberry jam. That was your business. And you wanted to sell to retail stores, grocery stores. So... The first thing you look at is what industry you're going to sell in. So you decide you're not going to sell to the really, really large chains, but the smaller chains or the larger independent grocery stores. Uh, um, and I know uh, uh, there's, a, um, there's a Coleman's out there, right? Am I right, Scott? And there's a couple of other stores. Rex, Rex right? Coleman's, so, sure. Yeah. Belden's. Yeah, so, so, but, you know, maybe you don't go up to the – what's the largest grocery stores you have out there? Uh, we just have Dominion and Sobeys. Yeah. So you may avoid Dominion and Sobeys when you start because they may be too big. They may have their own supplier chain. And before you go there, I always tell people that, you know, try tackling a smaller business, but not too small because they may not have the budget, right? And that's where the second piece of the puzzle comes in here. You'll see here is the size of the business. So typically what some people do is they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm making this homemade uh, raspberry jam. I'm going to go after the big ones, Sobeys and Dominions, but then you're going to have to get in line like the rest of everybody else to get through the door. Or you go after really, really, really small grocery stores. they got really small amounts of, uh, uh, of traffic. That's no good either. So what you do is you call, what I call is you go after the sweet spot. So the sweet spot means that they should have enough revenue and sales to have a budget or be willing to spend on your raspberry jam, but not so much that you'd be put on a waiting list before they saw you, right? Or put at the back of the line. So that's why I, I like this scope when you're looking at B2B, right? The size of their business, they can be in, in sales or employees or their budget, right? The third thing you can look at B2B is their culture. So you can say, you know, what's really important when I'm selling this raspberry jam is that these stores have strong community ties. 
and they have a specialty section in their grocery store because mine is going to be, you know, a specialty raspberry jam. And then the next lens could be where. So in this case, you may say, well, you know, it's not enough to, to be in St. John's. I also want to be in Corner Brook and Grand Falls and Windsor. I think I can actually expand that. So, yeah, you know, there's no magic number, but certainly you don't want to go crazy. You want some kind of starting point. This may be uh, um, worthwhile, right, uh, um, in, in terms of uh, what would you can start with in Newfoundland and really work that through first, right? And then the last piece could be, so who is the decision maker? And maybe you go directly to the owner or the manager of the store. So now what ends up happening is as you get this, you start to see that you get this um, ideal customer. And more importantly, this is going to help you later on when you look at marketing. So I'm going to stop at that point and ask if anyone has any questions. And again, I'll open it later at the end, but does anyone have questions at this point? We're okay? You can, and they can also type in the questions on the yeah, side exactly. of the chat box. Yeah. There's a chat box there. You can type it in as we go along. And don't be afraid to ask questions that are directly, directly related to your business because others can learn from that. My experience is the more specific, the better, right? Because they'll start to see, oh, I see how that works. Okay, there's no questions, I'll move on. Um, one of the things I wanted to share with you is, as much as possible, talk to your customers, your paying customers. Yes, it's lovely that your, you know, your grandmother and, and, and sister and brother love your idea, but um, it's really about talking to your paying customers. Aha, we've got something here. So, uh, Esther is right. Your research is focused on, on product, but research is more than that. I, and uh, uh, highlighting that, good. Yes, it's not just about the product research, right? It's it's about you. You start to see here that you know what's happening when we go back to that pie-shaped diagram. It's not just your offering, but how does it affect the customer? How do they see it through their eyes? And what is the marketplace? And one way to do that is through doing a customer survey. Or Taking that information, now please, if you do a customer survey, I don't need to see oodles and oodles of, of percentages in the actual business plan. That can go in the um, appendix. All I need to know is what did you learn from that? So you talk to 30 people who have tried your Raspberry Jam. And instead of giving percentages, what does that tell you about your product? What do they say? What do they like most? What was most important for them? Was it taste? Right? Was it the fact that it was all organic? So you're starting to learn from your customer what's really important for them. And I'm going to show you quickly the kind of survey you can do, because I think this is important. There's three types of surveys you can do. It's what's called closed-ended questions. We kind of know that. Yes, no, would you like, do you like raspberry jam? And if they say yes, okay, so big deal, who doesn't, right? I don't know what you really learned from that. Open-ended question is like, so what do you think about raspberry jam? Uh, I don't know. Like, what do you want to know? So you can have open-ended questions, and that's fine. But I find the best questions are the last one, option-ended questions, where you give some options to people and then you have a discussion. Because what it does, it starts triggering people to respond to the question. So let's give an example. So if you look at this, an option-ended question is something like, what is important to you when buying this product or service? So, and then you would give some options, right? Um, location, quality of product. Yeah, you can talk about price, but honestly, um, everybody's going to say price. So what are you going to learn from that? You know, we obviously will spend money on something we see valuable. Um, and price is a reflection of what's also available. When would you buy this product or service? How do you want this product or service? So, you know, how do you want this packaged? How do you want my strawberry jam or my uh, raspberry jam packaged? Where would you look to buy this? Which stores would you go to look at buy the raspberry jam? What would be the maximum? I like the word maximum as opposed to what would you be willing to pay? And then who are you? So you always save questions about them, like their demographic questions, their age, and till the end of the, you don't want to ask people up front, so can you tell me your age and how much you make? Oops, right, you want to save that to the end. And even then you give categories. But let's, let's take it a step further. Let me just show you a quick example. So, um, and I use this with a tutor because this is, this is on our web page um, under our, our sample business plan. But if you were doing a survey and you were starting a tutor company, you may list some of these questions that you see here. 
just take a look at it right now. You notice I've given some options. So if I said, Scott, so if you're hiring a tutor for your son or daughter, and let's say, you know, uh, this is all imaginary, obviously, at this point. You know, I would ask Scott, so in, prior, in order of priority, which would be the most important for you? And then Scott would say, oh. Um, um, the fee. You, sorry? The fee. The fee. So you get that off the table. So uh, as soon as someone tells you the fee, that's a given. So I tell people not to take that to heart because the fee is always reflective on the quality of what you give. So, yeah, they'll say the fee. But after the fee, what would you say next? Reputation. Yes. So now as you start doing this, you're going to start to see that, that each person will start to check off some of these and put in order priority. And if, for example, you start seeing that the reputation of the tutor is the most important, you've got some valuable information that you can use in your marketing. That information in your marketing becomes really valuable to reinforce time and time again in all your marketing materials. That's how you use a survey because you've, you've, you've um, now assessed the valuable learnings from this. This is not about kind of telling me why your idea is great. See, people have said they're going to pay me X amount of dollars. People have said they're going to like my idea. That's not what this is about. Specifically, what's important for them? When would they buy? So this is just one example. There's, you know, obviously, if we go back to this here, right, you do this for the first question, but then there's when would you buy this product? So when would you hire a tutor? Then I'd go back here. And then I'd have the same options, and then I'd ask um, uh, Scott to do the same process. And then you notice there's a section that says other. So while I, you know, none of these reasons resonate with me, there's the, here's the real reason why I would hire a tutor. Here's the real reason when I would hire a tutor. And we can have, we can check it off. We can have a discussion. So I prefer option-ended questions. And then, you know, here's the thing: how many do you do? Well, I usually tell people that when you're doing this, uh, if you're doing B to B, sorry, B to C. Oh, I jumped the gun here a bit more. Is roughly 30. If you do more, that's great. Um, for for B to B, you know, just doing five is 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 pretty good. Because if I'm doing raspberry jams, you know, if I just talk to five grocery owners, I, I'm pretty sure I can get some good valuable information from them, right? So that's why for B to B, you don't have to do as many uh, uh, as much survey as as opposed to B to C. But don't worry, do as many as you can. And what you're really looking for is a pattern. If I consistently see that over here, that people are keep checking off reputation of the tutor as their number one, then I'm onto something. I need to remember this. I need to remember this in my marketing. Okay. So um, what's important here in when you're looking at your market research, and this happens a lot, always ask yourself, what questions do I want answers? And if you can't find it on the internet, then get off the internet, right? So uh, let's face it, a lot of us go on the internet and we surf, and then, you know, three hours later, we end up, uh, uh, well, you know, maybe I need to take a, a trip to Florida. Uh, well, who knows why? Because I was just, I didn't know what I was looking for. I kind of was looking for shoe stores, but I, this is what happened. Because you didn't know what questions you were looking for. So if you have a list of questions and you go after it and you can't find it on the internet, that tells you, well, maybe you won't find it, and maybe you should start talking to people. Start talking to business owners. Start talking to people in other cities. I've had other my clients talk to um, companies in another city to get information because you know maybe the competitors don't want to reveal any information. Observe for hand, firsthand. Um, ultimately, people may say one thing but do another. So as you can start to see, this is not a clear-cut game where all of the answers are black and white. This is more about your approach. So before I move for, for, further. I'm going to open it up for questions. Does anyone have any questions at this point? No? All right. You're kind of quiet there. What's the weather out like there, Scott? Is it? What's... It's, ex it's a lot of rain and extremely windy. Ah, there we go. So maybe, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Typical okay. wind. Okay. The next one, we'll move on and then we'll open it up again for questions and, and, and you know, I'll have a chat a bit. The next one is, this is sort of the outline um, of market research. You can see that uh, the first major section is how does the marketplace work? 
Then the second is from when you, you sort of get an understanding what the rules of the game are, what makes someone successful in, in this particular industry. Um, what's the local market like? Go micro fast. Who are the key competitors? What's the key target market? Who are your best customers? What's the key to success? The key to success may be something that is a combination of um, marketing activities plus ensuring the quality of your items, the, the, the delivery, maybe the selection, if we're talking about a shoe store or the jam, um, the quality, uh, uh, quality control of the jam, the packaging of the jam, um, developing key relationship with grocery owners, and then a customer survey summary where you summarize what you learned in your customer survey in a paragraph and all of the detail goes in the um, appendix. Always keep in mind that if you've got pictures, photos of your product or service, then include that, but put that in your appendix. It only adds value to, to your business plan. Also keep in mind that if you're doing a location-based business, you can't do a business plan without, first of all, identifying where that location is, right? I'm sure, like any parts of, of, of any town or city, you know, where you set up shop in you know, certain sections of St. John's or if I set up in Corner Brook, it's going to have a different feel and therefore my business plan will have to be tailored to that specific location. So it's really important to talk, start talking to landlords, getting an idea of, in fact, how much the rent is, what's the square footage, would they be willing to rent this out to you, and then basing your business plan based on that potential location. Okay, so before we open it up for general uh, questions, um, just remember that, you know, you have to keep digging that uh, research is, is, you know, you're really, it's another word for being curious, asking, poking, um, testing assumptions. Uh, um, the more you can do that, the better off you'll be with, with, your, with your business. And certainly, um, the better off you'll be in, in looking at assumptions that may be completely wrong. So, for example, one assumption that too many entrepreneurs may make is that I know who my best customers are because I'm one of them. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the ideal customer. Um, it's very, it can be very challenging if you say you are the best customer. My experience is you are never the best customer. You never know who the best customer is until you start digging. People always buy for their reasons, not for your reasons. And as entrepreneurs, we need to be on guard with that. Otherwise, we may make some fatal assumptions. Okay, so um, I'm going to open up for some general questions again, and then I'm going to wrap up and we'll talk about the, the next steps and so forth. So, general questions about market research. Does anyone have any general questions about market research? And, how and Dominic, it's Scott again. Yes, Scott. While we're waiting for a question, uh, if I could quickly jump in. Again, for those people who might not know, I might have missed the beginning. My name is Scott Andrews, and I'm the Business Development Manager for Futurepreneur in Newfoundland and Labrador, based in St. John's. Uh, so if anybody has any specific futurepreneur-related questions eventually after the call, they can follow up with me. I have my email address there and my phone number. And I'm also going to post, Dominic, to uh, a link to Futurepreneur's YouTube channel because okay. last week's session, in case anybody missed last week's session or they'd like to watch it again because it was amazing, uh, we have that entire session recorded. And I'm guessing within maybe 24 hours, this session will be uploaded to our YouTube channel so you can watch this one again. Okay? Great. Thanks. So good. I'm good. Just in time because Sandy has a question. Um, yes, so would it uh, make sense to include actual client survey results? Yes, so that goes in the appendix. And then what you do is you extrapolate, what did you learn from that survey, Sandy? So you would say, these are the things I learned from my client. To move. So what's important here is you take that information, and what did that tell you that you need to do to move your business forward? So if we come back to that example about tutoring, let's say you do that survey and find out that you know, 85% of the people are checking off reputation. So now you say, it's really important for the tutoring service I start to emphasize my 10 years of strong uh, um, customer service and reputation with my clients in my marketing material. Okay, great, you've learned something, now you can use it forward. So the second part of your question, um, uh, that you've already secured co a contract before your business plan, which what you do is now you say, okay, so how did you secure that? How did that happen? That's part of your research, right? Um, but certainly you can use that information, so do not be afraid to talk about what you've already done and what have you already learned. Does that make sense, Andy? 
good. Oh, good. We got more questions. Okay, so let's go. Uh, I like that. So Jill says, other than contacting actual customers, what is the best approach to distributing survey questionnaires to potential customers? Just through social media website. So you can use um, social media um, to distribute your, your your questionnaire, but be, two things you need to mind: make sure it's the right target group. So just because you have 500 friends doesn't mean they're the right target group. So that's not going to help you, right? If if you uh, if if you're selling at B2B and none of the, your your friends happen to be in that business. However, you can use it, but if you do it, and you know there's something like. Um, Survey Monkey that you, you can use for free to send out questions. If you do it online, then remember two things. One, please get people a deadline. So don't say, can you please fill the survey out? That's no good. I don't know about you, but we're all busy. So when do you want this? So say, please fill this out by February the 1st, 2.30 p.m. Don't tell them why. They don't have to know why. You just tell them I need it by then. Two days before, you send one another email saying, I know you're busy, but I'm really looking forward to having this survey completed by February the 1st, 2.30 p.m. If you could fill this out, this could really help uh, understand my business better. So in your particular case, Jill, yes, you can. Just make sure it's targeted, and B, make sure you have a deadline for them. Does that make sense? And then Jess says, uh, do at least 30. Um, do you mean 30 questions? No, no, no. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm glad to, I'm your correct. So Jess says, um, when you said to do at least 30 on the survey, what I really meant is 30 surveys, and not 30 questions on the survey. So you would, you know, roughly you don't want to have more than, let's say, I don't know, 12 questions. You don't have too many questions because typically my experience is people don't want to do more than 10 minutes of surveying, right? So plan it so that you've got maybe 10 questions or so, um, 12, not too many. But but I'm talking about 30 people. Does that make sense? Good. So um, any other questions? These are good questions, by the way. I like these questions because they clarify. Um, okay, focus groups. So just talks about focus groups. Yes, those are very yeah. Uh, so focus groups can be useful. I just find it's hard to coordinate and get focus groups. Just so you know, if you're doing a focus group, means that if I'm, uh, let's say, take the example of um, Raspberry Jam. You want to do a focus group on Raspberry Jams. So what you want to do is you get 10 people in a room, and, you, and for lack of a better word, you bribe them. You say, you know, you do this, and, and we'll, or I'll give you a pizza and, and a beer after it. Um, and then what you make sure you do is that someone else facilitates the focus group, not you. So you can't be facilitating this. You're the observer. You're the listener. You just take notes. You say nothing. The other person... Yeah, it does the focus group. So yes, you can get companies to do that, but it's expensive. Usually, like I know here in Toronto, they, they charge an arm and a leg to get that. If you're going to do a focus group, um, try to instead just to pay a facilitator or, or, or bribe them and say, you know, try to get 10, 30 friends in a room. Not 30, but, you know, 10 is, is more than enough. And then have, but what's really important is how you formulate the questions about the jam, Right. And so you may say, here are other jams. What do you like about these other jams? Here's this jam. What do you like about this jam? Where would you want to see this? So um, at answering your question, just yes, you can do focus groups. They're just harder to do, harder to organize. But by all means, if you can do it, certainly do it. Just keep these the kind of this this kind of sort of parameters that I have in mind. Answer your question, Jess. And Ryan posted a question above to Dominic. Oh, where? I don't. Ryan, did I miss it? Okay, uh, I can read it. Actually, uh, it might have been just to me. Uh, does Speechpreneur Canada help with location and demographic? So, uh, this if, if Futurepreneur, So, here's the great thing: we have a software called Pinpoint. So, when you send us um, a location, we can give you data in demographics in that area, but what we can't do is we can't tell you this is the location that's open for you. Like if, you, if I'm doing a, a shoe store, I can't say go to this area. These are locations that are open for you to set up your store. That's something you have to do on your own. You have to knock on doors, talk to landlords. But once you feel that you found, you've talked to a landlord, you think this is a pretty good location, then you can email us and say, here's a potential location I have in mind for my business. It's you know downtown St. John's or, or Corner Brook or wherever, right? And then you give us the exact location, you know, 125 Broadway and, 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 and the Corner Brook. 
and then off we go we'll give you the demographics and the breakdown for that location so good question we we have that uh, capability and if I can jump in there and maybe answer some of Ryan's question too. When it comes to demographics, um, there's two really good resources here in Newfoundland and Labrador. I'll just use the Newfoundland and Labrador one now, even though I know we have people on the call from North America. Uh, Canada Business is an amazing resource. I'll yeah. post the link there in the chat box. Uh, we do have two people who work here in Newfoundland and Labrador, and they can help with all sorts of demographic information. Uh, amazing resource from demographics and stuff like that. And on the local front, from Newfoundland and Labrador, there's a really good website called Community Accounts, and it has lots of tables, charts, maps, profiles, amazing demographics that you can dig down to, and both of those are free. So again, I'll post those in the chat, and if somebody wants more information on those, they can certainly email me. Fantastic, Scott. That's really great. Great to hear, right? Yeah, great so for there secondary are, market are, research. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it's great to hear that they, you have those. Uh, you know, one of the things they always keep in mind whenever you, uh, when you're out there and you're doing market research, you always use what I call the, uh, the jumping method, which is once you talk to someone or, or, or get that information, is ask the person you're talking to, could they recommend anyone else you should talk to or other resources, right? It's really about, you know, as you connect with one person, they'll know someone else um, that you can go and, and access, and, and that's always useful, right, to do. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to take you through the last part of this. Um, and uh, that's this, is that next week, next Wednesday, I'm going to be doing one on turning people into customers, sales and marketing. Really, really important. For most of you, I would suspect that's going to be your biggest challenge, getting clients, getting customers. So I'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, I, it'll be the same process. Uh, you go in and register. Um, log in, and we'll do the same process. And thanks again, Scott, for sharing. And, and Scott suggested that we have breaks in between, like we're doing now, asking questions and doing a Q&A at the end. And, and Scott, who's at the ground level there in Newfoundland, um, will be available to give you even further re resources, which is great to hear. So um, obviously, as you all know, uh, so Sandy asked, uh, is the date set? Well, uh, Scott is working on that in March. So I know that I'm coming out there in Newfoundland in the week of March the 12th, but the exact dates are still being worked on. Am I correct, Scott? That is correct, yeah. I'm still waiting yeah. to get confirmation on one of the other sites, and then we'll figure out when the St. John's, Cornerbrook, and Grand Falls Windsor in-person wrap-up session will be. Yes, what will happen is I'll wrap everything up here that, you, that I've been talking about in a workshop format, how to put, it all, how to put all the pieces together. And then, of course, and the last Dominic thing. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, so for if anybody here uh, on this call right now, if you guys would be interested in doing an in-person session when Dominic comes down that week to, to participate in that session, uh, it will be hosted at the College of the North Atlantic. Uh, you can, again, shoot me an email. I'll post my email there, and I'll let you guys know specifically when the date is because we're hoping to pin that down this week. Okay? Fantastic. Again, Scott's there and, and, and um, coordinating the show, so it should be great. Um, I, I know most of you are, that are on, on this have either attended the workshop or attended the webinar. Then the last thing, of course, we have these free resources online. If you haven't already, please check it out. It's free. Our business plan writer is free. Our cash flow template is great and free. We've got crash courses, so please use it. There are resources available for you. So with all that in mind, um, I want to thank you for being on this call. It's, it's been great having you. Um, and now that I've been in Newfoundland, I'm always eager to get back there and, and, and uh, talk about uh, business opportunities and, and just what I've seen. And, and it's great to connect with Scott. Scott, I'm looking forward to, to connecting with you again. But we will connect next week, same time, same bat channel. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you all. Thanks, Dominic. Bye-bye. <laughs>